In today's world, we hear a lot about how one country's students stack up against another country's students. These comparisons have most popularly been measured by the PISA test, administered by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The PISA, or the Program for International Student Assessment, is a test administered to 15-year-olds in OECD member countries every three years since the year 2000. In 2000, the first PISA results showed that the average 15-year-old in the U.S. scored a 493, while the average OECD score was a 500. This placed U.S. students at 18 out of 27 participating OECD countries. In science, U.S. students did slightly better, almost hitting the OECD average, placing 14th overall in 27 participating OECD countries. We can see that results in math and in science haven't really changed all that much since the PISA test started being administered. In fact, the National Center for Education Statistics recently came to this exact conclusion. This isn't for lack of trying either. These results don't reflect the incredible effort and expenditures since the year 2000 in improving student scores in STEM areas. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Unfortunately, when most people say STEM, they often mean SM. Engineering and technology remain largely untaught in U.S. public education. When they are taught, it is most often as an elective rather than as part of a student's core education. This is because engineering and technology are not part of the core curriculum. Even the schools that do teach engineering and technology have to make sure that whatever they do with engineering and technology aligns with established core standards. This may be because of findings from research that indicates that students struggle with even some of the most basic mathematical concepts, such as variables, functions, and how to apply math to real-world problems. An unintended consequence of dealing with this apparent deficiency is the winnowing of education to focus on the basics. The notion is that spending more time with subjects the students struggle with will improve their understanding of that topic. While increased time of task may increase test scores, in practice, what happens is that many students that are to perform in language arts and mathematics must spend extra time engaged in these subjects, whereas those that perform well may choose the time for other activities. Thus, overall, the result is a reduction in non-essential school topics. This is problematic. Interestingly, research shows a strong correlation between mathematics performance and computer programming, and this relationship goes both ways. Prior experience and success in math has repeatedly been shown to be a positive predictor of success in computer programming. Even better, learning to program has also been shown to lead to increased interest in and effort in applying mathematics. Learning about engineering and technology actually has the potential to strengthen students' understanding of math and science. Let's consider a simple side-scroller game, like Super Mario Brothers. Playing the game doesn't require any mathematical thinking, but in programming the game, Students can use several mathematical concepts and formulae. Let's look at this through the creation of our own side-scrolling game with a biker who has to dodge obstacles. But let's look at it like a programmer. The very first thing we notice is that students have to use a coordinate system to position the biker. To move the biker, let's suppose the students have to change his position on the x-axis by two points. Every time I press the right button, the biker moves two steps to the right. Remember that one of the most basic mathematical concepts students struggle with is the notion of variable? In this game, creating something as simple as a score for, say, jumping over a log is a great way to introduce and use variables. Look at my score now. So far, this game isn't that exciting. Let's throw things at this biker. That always makes things more exciting, right? Detecting the difference between the biker and the log was easy. We only had to see how close they were to each other on the x-axis. What about this paintball? It's coming at him on an angle. It's a lot harder to detect the angle that is coming at him. Let's look at that again in slow motion, and let's put our programmer glasses on. We know the x and the y of all of these objects, so we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out how far apart they are. And in this case, change the background color as a warning to the player that he's about to get splat. In this simple game, a student would utilize concepts such as coordinate systems, variables, order of operations, functions, and even the Pythagorean theorem. Just think of it. When a student asks, when am I ever going to use this in real life? Instead of telling the student on the test next week, 
a teacher can say, in this cool game you're going to make. Why might programming in this way help mathematics? Well, consider that the, this blue shape represents the idea of a function in algebra. And let's suppose this red shape represents the idea of a function in JavaScript. Individually, we see each of these shapes as a square. But if we have the ability to see them both at the same time, what do we see? We might recognize that each is a side of a shape with greater dimensions. Understanding what a function is from its many different angles might just be more useful than spending more time looking at a function from a single direction repeatedly. Instead of giving students who struggle with mathematics an additional hour of the same thing, perhaps showing them a different side of the cube will help them to understand it better. Why does every student learn about biology, history, chemistry, language arts, and physical sciences? One view is that learning about these subjects better helps us to understand the world we live in. As we better understand the world, we gain better control and mastery over it. Well, technology is part of the world we live in today, and there's every indication that the world is becoming increasingly technological. If we want to have power over the technological part of the world that we live in, we need to learn to understand it. We need to study it. Many school administrators and legislators realize that mastering technology is important and that students should be learning more technology at an earlier age. In Utah, we have a business group that's promoting that all students have technological training by 2020. Similarly, we have a technology advisory group that recommends changes to state's legislators who are advocating for improvements in technology education. But consider that we're this yellow dot here, and the technology we want to master is here. The logic is that if we move toward the goal, we'll eventually attain it. Unfortunately, many proposals don't go far enough. You see, technology is also moving forward. If we want students to be technologically savvy and ready to master the world when they graduate from school, we need to project where their technology will be when they graduate and move instead to intersect it. So what's the solution? Well, the United Kingdom seems to have realized that in order to better prepare students to be masters of the technological world they will inherit, they must start early, in kindergarten in fact, and continue with learning technology throughout their formative years. By the end of eighth grade, all pupils ought to be able to understand and apply fundamental principles and concepts of computer science. This includes ideas such as abstraction, logic, creating algorithms, and how to represent data. Students ought to be able to analyze problems in computational terms and have repeated practical experience of writing computer programs in order to solve such problems. Students ought to be able to evaluate and apply information technology, including new and unfamiliar technologies, analytically to solve problems. And students will become responsible competent, and competent and creative users of information communication technologies. We advocate that students learn to think computationally from an early age. Computational thinking is a way of using logic to solve problems. It involves the process of creating abstractions, such as algorithms. We then use technology to automate those abstractions and collect and analyze data. Computational thinking teaches us to be able to use these analyses to improve our world through technology. Thus, it's a cycle where we start by imagining how to solve a problem and use technology to create a solution to that problem and then analyze the results provided through technology to generalize and continually improve the process. So how do we foster computational thinking? One way we're currently promoting computational thinking is by using robotics with elementary school students. Consider a current challenge some of these students are working on. In this challenge, students need to get a robot to pick up a ball, work its way through a simple maze of walls, and then place the ball in a container at the end of the maze, much like a Mars rover would do that's being sent across the stars. The challenge is that students won't know the order of the opening in each of the three walls. Allowing young children to physically handle objects, such as robots, helps them understand how the physical world can be manipulated through some of our programming. Young children are wildly curious about the physical world and how things work. Early on, we can teach them about simple machines and have them build their own to solve simple but common problems. There are an increasing number of apps for the iPad that kids can use to learn engineering and coding principles. A recent study that examined 45 programmers' experience in learning to program 
found that nearly 75% of those surveyed began coding to either make or cheat games. Learning to make games is a great way to learn to think computationally. There are a number of simple game programming tools that allow students to learn to code games by dragging and dropping commands. This is called visual programming and is a great way to learn to think computationally and get a first experience in programming. There are a number of visual programming tools available for kids to learn and make their own games, such as Scratch, Game Salad, Game Maker, Sploder, GameStar Mechanic, Alice, Tinker. Then, students can move on to learn textual programming languages, such as JavaScript, Python, ActionScript, PHP, Lua, and so on. And teachers don't have to start from scratch to do this. There are organizations who have now put together curricula that teachers can pick up and use to teach children programming, such as Code.org, CodeHS, Code in the Schools, LearnStreet, Code Avengers, Code Combat, Khan Academy, Coursera, edX, and many more. We envision students then using their coding skills to manipulate and create physical devices, such as the Lego Mindstorms robots we're currently working with, or Arduino, a small microprocessor that can be used in a variety of smaller projects, such as reprogramming your home's thermostat, measuring the temperature of meal as it cooks in a crock pot all night long, or a host of experiments that could be used as a way of collecting data for science and math classes. The Raspberry Pi is another example a programmable mini-computer suitable for larger projects, even though it's the size of a small handheld device, is something students could learn to program and create on their own. Or advanced projects with robotics, such as VEX Robotics, an advanced robotics system. Does this mean that instead of having a shortage of programmers, we will create an overabundance, and that it will become increasingly difficult for programmers to find a job? I don't think so. People will still become sociologists, medical examiners, weather forecasters, artists, writers, linguists, programmers, and so on. Only now we'll have more people in other fields who understand the technology better, such that they can make it work for them and adapt to their needs. By fostering students' ability to think computationally, we help them become masters of a technological world instead of slaves to it.